you know what please remember please remember our request good evening everybody our live audience as well as our virtual audience good evening and we are currently at the university of the west indies open campus in dominica that is and uh, the national youth council is holding the post budget youth panel discussion to give you the perspective of the youth on the national budget for Dominica for 2023-2024. So we welcome you to this event and everyone who is currently tuned in on DBS Facebook page, the National Youth Council of Dominica Facebook page, our panelists in the auditorium as well as on the Zoom, we welcome you this um, evening. I now invite you to stand as we have a short word of prayer. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing these esteemed youth here today to give their perspective on the importance and development of our nation. We ask that you guide these proceedings this evening. We ask that you help us to bring a collective response to what has taken place a few weeks ago. We thank you for bringing us all here today and giving us health and strength as well. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I thank you. You may have your seats. And today we have a number of panelists. So you are seeing three at the table, and we also have two online this evening. So there are five panelists and two moderators, and I will give them an opportunity to introduce themselves. And we'll begin with our virtual audience. So Miss Pascal and Miss Jeffers, are you all able to hear a thumbs up? All right, so they can hear me. So I'm going to ask the first person that I'm seeing on my screen, um, Imana Jeffers, to introduce herself and, you know, give our audience a brief who you are. Good night, everyone. I hope you can hear me clearly. Oh, yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, good night. Um, I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy to be chosen as one of the panelists here. Um, I don't like speaking about myself, you know, <laughs> but <laughs> my name is... You said my name already, Imana Jeffers. Um, I will say that I am a woman of many hats. I have been involved in various youth groups, societies, both academics and locally. Um, currently, well, my most current leadership position was serving on the CYN, that's the Caribbean Youth Environmental Network, as the country lead, the past country lead. And also, I like to dabble in sports a little bit, and I served on the executive of the 767 Sports Club as the Secretary General. So I have done a lot, and I wear many hats. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in international relations with management, and currently, I am a master's candidate in the degree of international trade policy. So I would call myself a, a budding trade and investment specialist. I'm trying to build my portfolio now to become a trade and investment specialist. And I think that's enough about me. That would give you guys at least, you know, a little brief of where my specialty lies so that we could move on to the discussion for tonight. Thank you, Imana. So we're starting off with a bang. That, that is a caliber that we are following. Thank you, Imana. Thank you so much. And I wish you well in your studies. And we also have Miss Stephanie Pascal on Zoom as well. Stephanie, give us a bit of an intro. Hi, thank you so much. Um, my name is Stephanie Pascal, and I am an aspiring um, economist. I would have graduated the Dominican State College in 2017 as the Victorian, um, as a triple major in economics, math, and physics. I would have taken a two-year break. In that time, I would have worked at the National Bank of Dominica 
And then I would have resumed my studies in 2019 at the University of the West Indies Cable Campus. Um, I recently graduated with my bachelor's in economics and math um, in October 2022 as librarian as well. Um, I would have continued, continued my studies right away. I'm currently pursuing my master's in financial and business economics. And, you know, in throughout my academic career, similar to Imana, I strive to be a very multifaceted individual. So I have been involved in a slew of different um, organizations ranging from climate change, ranging from volunteerism in terms of my work with the Rotary Club of Dominica. Um, I would have been involved in the different sports clubs while I was in high school. And even in terms of leadership, in terms of governance, I would have served as the president of DSC Student Government Association, and most recently at UE, the vice president of the Guild of Students for the last academic year. And so um, I have a very, very wide range of interests. And similar to Iman, I'm very honored to be here this evening. I think conversations and discussions like these are very pertinent. And in fact, I would have recently did a, a budget analysis of this budget. Um, it was my first time doing um, something of that sort. And I just wanted to try my hand at it because I feel that conversations such as these are very critical and very important for us as, as not just young people, but as a society in general to have. And so I'm very ecstatic to be here to, you know, give my analysis, give my contribution, but also to hear the different panelists. We have a very esteemed panel of different varying backgrounds. And so as much as I come here to impart knowledge, I also am here to learn. So thank you so much. Thank you, Stephanie. And our virtual audience already provides a real perspective. And there's even more perspective at our head table. So we have three esteemed young people, youth at our head table. And I will begin with the president of the National Youth Council, Mr. Fire Lander, to ask him to introduce himself. Okay, good afternoon to good evening. Sorry, guys. <laughs> it's been a long day. <laughs> but good evening to everybody. My name is Fire Lander. I am the current president of the National Youth Council of Dominica. And I am a registered nurse by profession and also hold a bachelor's degree in nursing with um, continuing professional education in human resource management and uh, as well as events management and project management. So we are here this evening to have a very in-depth discussion as it pertains to what's in this budget for young people and uh, as well as my focus will be tailored to the focus on youth as well as health. So I'm looking forward to, as Stephanie said, learning, as well as to share some insight from my personal analysis of the budget presentation. And looking forward to chat away forward for us as young people in Dominica. So I'm excited to be on this panel with some esteemed and talented young persons from Dominica. Thank you, File. Thank you. And we move on to Miss Ashma McDougall, who was um the well, she's the immediate past president of the National Youth Council, and I'll allow her to introduce the rest. Well, you've already said all. <laughs> Well, um, as I told File when I came in this evening, I'm going to introduce myself by first in, um, welcoming everyone. Mabrika, Mabrika, I mean, I may not look indigenous. Bossway. We celebrated <laughs> World Indigenous Youth Day um, yesterday, World Indi Indigenous Peoples, Peoples Day, Day yesterday. And so I wish to extend a happy Indigenous Peoples Day to all Indigenous people. Um, you're welcome, <laughs> Mr. Paris. <laughs> um, let me first extend, commend the National Youth Council of Dominica for initiating conversations like this, um, especially among youth. Um, I feel like our participation in the pre-budget consultation last year definitely gives like, you know, a good continuation of the dialogue post-budget this year. My name is Ash McDougall, and as the communications lead, Jamasha said, I am the immediate past president of the National Youth Council of Dominica. I am currently the Director of Student Activities at the Dominica State College, and I also serve as a Senior Lecturer of Economics 
and I'm privileged to be sitting on the panel with two of my former students, <laughs> both Evana and um, Stephanie, and I'm very proud of how far they've, they've come in their educational pursuits. I am also an entrepreneur myself. I dabble in a lot of things different spheres and, um, and um, currently, currently I am, I am the chairperson, chairperson of the research committee of the OECS Youth Advisory, Youth Advisory Network. Network and, and I look I forward, look to, forward this, to this course this, course this, course this evening because, because you know you know youth youth are, are proclaimed, proclaimed to be the future, to be the future but, but in my own perspective, in my own perspective youth are no youth are no and so it's and so it's very necessary, necessary to ensure that you are, are discussing engaging in this course like this and obviously contributing to potential solutions that can drive more economic development and growth and Dominica. Dominica. So thank you for so having, thank you me, for having and me, and I look and forward I look to the discourse this evening. Thank you, Ashma. Thank you, Ashma. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So that's so going to be very difficult, difficult to follow, but uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so yeah, my so name is my name Davidson Edwards, Edwards or Tony. Or Tony. Um, um, I am, um, um, again, again you know, very, happy very happy to, to be part, part of this panel. Of this panel. Uh, I'm, uh, really I'm really interested in, in you know, you talking know, about, talking about um, um, well, you well, know, discussing, you know, discussing these, these, these issues, issues that affect all of us as Dominicans, right? Like, I feel like, to a large extent, in our minds, we have this separation between our daily lives and and how the how countries run, run by, by the persons who are in charge, are in charge of running, of running it. And, and actually, there's, and no, actually divide, there's no divide, right? right? Like, like, it's one existence, one existence it is us that's, us running, that's it. running it. And, and therefore, you know, it makes sense that we should all be part of the discussion. So I was very happy to be invited here tonight to be part of the discussion. I'll add what I can. Um, my background is in technology and business. I currently run a, um, a software company, an e-commerce software company called ShopDM. Some of you may have heard of it. What we do is we partner with other businesses in Dominica, and we help them digitize and sell their products online. Um, and once you buy their products online, you can get uh, those products delivered to any part of Dominica, from Portsmouth to, you know, Sufria, any, anywhere. So really, we're something similar to the Amazon of Dominica, but really we're focused on economic <laughs> impact, right? That's correct. <laughs> yes. And, and, and that interest in economic impact is why I'm happy to take part in this tonight. So I'm just going to end there, and yeah, we're going. So as you can see, we have... Uh, five esteemed panelists and yes we're trying to rectify that yes the technicians are trying to rectify rectify that so um as i was saying we have a panel of esteemed young people people who are involved in every sector that runs or governs the affairs of our country. We have agriculture, we have technology, education, health, finance, all of the important sectors that govern our country. So I know that we will be having a fruitful discussion and it is serving our objective this afternoon, this evening that is, to educate the young people and to give the young people a voice in this um, discussion of national importance. A lot of times we hear these speeches and we are not able to analyze what is in it or analyze what is in it for us, the youth, and how it will affect us. So it is definitely something of national importance and National Youth Council of Dominica so it fit to have uh, this panel discussion. And it wouldn't be a panel discussion if we didn't have moderators. And uh, this evening we have two moderators. We have Miss Wendy Wallace Wendy, you can you know give us a little a little wave, of course. Miss Wendy Wallace is our second vice president on the National Youth Council. She is currently a lecturer at the Academic School of Learning, and we also have another moderator, which is Mr. Keanu Winston, first vice president of the National Youth Council, and he is involved in education as well as well as a number of voluntary acts, like a member of the Rotaract Club. So we do have a panel and moderators of esteemed um, perspective, and I definitely look forward to a fruitful discussion. So I will, be now, I will now pass on the microphone to our moderators, and we will officially begin the discussion. And I was told that my moderators will come to the podium, right? All right, so let's make them feel welcome. 
even those virtually, you can send a little clapping emoji. We are in a technological era. So let's make Miss Wallace and Mr. Winston feel welcome. Good evening. Um, I opted for us to stand because I think this will be the only two minutes you may see us on the stream. So we want to say good night to everyone who is looking, everyone who is supporting National Youth Council. We'd like to thank you for coming on. To the people who are here at the University of the West in this global campus site, we thank you for coming. We have some past senators and current senators here supporting us, and we are very thankful for that. I have Miss Wallace here with me. Say hi to the people at home. <laughs> Good evening, everyone, and likewise, I'm quite honored to moderate this session. I think this 2023-2024 budget is more than just a budget announcement. I think it is something of critical importance for young people in Dominica to understand uh, not just the budget, but budgetary allocations and the implications on their lives, um, on their lives of, the f of their future, as well as the sustainability of our economy. So I do encourage you to please take notes throughout this discussion. And uh, yeah, let's have a fruitful and productive evening. Thank you. So as Ms. Wallace said, was saying, sorry, take notes. Those of you who are joining us virtually as well via the DBS radio page and the National Youth Council of page, you are also welcome to send in your questions. We have persons here who will be looking at the stream, so when the time for question comes, we'll be passing on your question to any of the panelists you'd like to speak to. Thank you, and we will be beginning now. Okay, so good evening once again. I am now com comfortably in my seat. So like I mentioned, this 2023-2024 budget is more than just a budget announcement. This topic this evening, of course, is a question we have every single year. Does the government balance its books in the context of the performance of the economy? It is a statement of intent, that is the budget, on how the government really plans to lead Dominica throughout the next fiscal year. Will it be platitudes and trite promises? Or have the government really come up with a plan to deal with the uncertain times that we are living in? Some of which the Honorable Dr. McIntyre would have mentioned um, in the initial pages of the budget. Being subjected to natural disasters, dealing with the effects of a pandemic, the geopolitics of the Russian-Ukraine war, and how it triggered inflationary shocks, leading to the high cost of living and the likes. So again, I encourage you, the audience, to take note of your questions throughout this discussion, after which we will open the floor for questions, comments, and yeah, even emotional outbursts. <laughs> okay, I know Keanu is not a panelist, but Keanu, we are speaking to the young people of Dominica. And before we even delve into the ambit of the discussion, identifying the pillars that were highlighted by the Honorable Dr. McIntyre. Keanu, I want you to look to the camera, look in the camera, and tell the young people of Dominica what is a budget and the significance of a budget. Okay, so let me see if I can break it down to layman's terms. <laughs> um, from my understanding of what a budget is, I mean our economists will further develop it. A budget is a statement which indicates what the revenues and the expenditures for the year will be. Revenue meaning money earned, expenditure being what you plan on spending. And the way, based on what was discussed in Parliament and the pre-budget consultations that were held with the youth and with the small business owners, agri-people and other um, sectors of society, the way the budget was prepared, these conversations were held and the input from these sectors were taken into consideration. You saw that IPP Ashma spoke about it earlier that the, the consultation we had last year with the youth, a lot of what she presented fueled the budget in regards to youth last year. So we know that they, these are taken very seriously. And of course, we know the permanent secretaries and the different senior officers in the ministry come together and they plan their budget to submit so that they can have the overall budget 
presented. It is very important because a budget lets you know what your country can do within the fiscal year. Some people may consider and see that why we're not doing this or why we're not doing that, but we have to look to see what was allocated where, how it was allocated and what it was allocated for. So that's what the budget document guides for people to realize what's happening. So it's very important as young people that so that you can look at the budget presentation, even if you don't want to go through all the debates, because we know the debates can be lengthy and long and go up to all 10, 11 in the night, but at least the initial budget presentation as to the the document, the expenditure, the revenue, it's very important for you to listen to that so you can have an idea of what the government at the time is planning on doing for you and listen very carefully to see how you can benefit as a young person. I think that's another panelist, as you said, so let me stop here. That's fine. Thank you so much. And now that we have clarified the significance of a budget, I really want to hear from the panelists your instant takeaways from the budget. Uh, this is where you're going to present your opening remarks. But just to listen the air a bit, I want to ask a very troublesome question. Considering the times that we're living in, what theme, if you had to present a budget for the next fiscal year, what theme would that be? So before you present your opening remarks, I would love to hear your idea of a theme for this fiscal year. Um, so we can begin with those online. So I will begin with Stephanie Pascal. Hi, good evening. Um, in terms of a theme, I want it to be more data-driven, more a, a greater emphasis on human resource. As the Honorable McIntyre rightfully said, there is a lot going on in the wider world. We are susceptible to a lot of different external shocks. And as, as a small island developing state, that leaves us particularly vulnerable. There's not much the government can do in terms of mitigating against inflation. I see a lot of persons com complain about the price, you know, the different prices of, of different items. And the reality of our situation is that there is genuinely not much that can be done. Yes, there are different policies that can be implemented to, you know, essentially take off the burden on the everyday person. But as much as possible, it is something that will be felt. It is something that we will be affected by. So that's the first thing. And so because of that increased susceptibility to all these external shocks, we need to make ourselves as self-sufficient as possible. And again, that will be challenging because again, as small as, as a small island developing state, we really do need, you know, our connections with the wider world. Um, but for me, I think as a country, we need to get serious um, about addressing our population issue. For me, that's a very big thing. Our population has not grown significantly um, since gaining independence. And that is a serious issue because we need people to push the economy forward. Um, it is argued that the human resource is the most important resource. Um, we see the theme for this budget references our limited resources. And I think one of the key limited resources we have is the lack of, is the lack of inhabitants within, within Dominica. So I would like to, uh, to start there. Even in terms of data, for me, the only part of the budget that was really data driven, I would say for the most part was agriculture. Um, and if anyone had to read the agriculture portion of the budget, it was very extensive. So in terms of the allocation for different resources in, and different resources in terms of they spoke about feeder roads to increase access for our different farmers. They spoke about technical support. They talked, they spoke about um, investing X amount so that we can fight different diseases. They, they include a lot of numbers. They include a lot of statistics. In the other areas of the budget, that was significantly lacking. And for me, an area that I was particularly disappointed in was tourism. So the government has the goal of 
increase in sale of visitors to 500,000 um, by 2030. And they plan to implement this four, four point strategic plan, which I commend them for. Um, but even in terms of the specifics for that strategic plan, it's very vague. It's, 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 it, there's not a, a lot of information as to exactly how are we going to improve visitor experience? How are we going to improve product development? How are we going to improve? Um, well, I guess in terms of access, we kind of know in terms of, you know, the international airport and the marina that they would have spoken of. But I feel that for such a critical industry like tourism, more specifics would be required. Even in terms of why are we, why are the even in terms of why are we focusing on these particular sectors? What would have inspired the government to focus on education? What would have inspired them to focus on social protection? What would have inspired them to focus on all these different policies? Um, there needs to be some sort of analysis done as to what are the direct goals we are trying to achieve. Um, is it mainly social welfare? Is it mainly long-term economic growth? Is it short-term economic growth? all of the different things that we need to consider. And so I think a critical point that I want to bring up is that moving forward, we really do need more data. It needs to be um, more present within the budget and also for, you know, individuals like myself, the, the, the average citizen, so that we can review this document and we can understand the, the rationale behind the government's decision. So I will pause there and allow the other panelists to contribute. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Uh, Stephanie, while we are going to address some of the key points that you mentioned in your opening remarks, I think one of the things that really struck my attention was it well is the fact that we are quite data deficient in Dominican and in fact the Caribbean. So we arrive at different policies on the basis of little to no data at all. So right. definitely it begs the question as to the logical development of some of these policies and plans um, to be inputted into a budget. Okay, so we're gonna head over to Emana. Emana, I would love to hear your theme and you can dive straight into your opening remarks. All right, good night everyone. So I think it's important to go over the pillars of this budget before I even speak about my team. So the government had five pillars and they are more effective governance, public service modernization and transformation, greater service, um, focus on the productive sector and also ensuring financial stability. Now, the reason why I made mention of these pillars is because it will basically build or structure the theme that I would have. The theme that I would have is that transparent, open, community-based, and data-driven. Now, the reason why I chose this type of theme is because, importantly so, three of the pillars, three of the pillars that the government have for the budget this year is basically, or it captures the essence of e-governance. And that is very important because mentioned in the budget is good governance. Now, what is e-governance, if you may ask? So this definition is basically built from readings that I've done over the years in my field. So I have put together a very easy to understand definition so that the everyday person can understand it. So e-governance is basically a shortened term for electronic governance. What is that? It is basically the use of ICT to make the process of governance at different levels more effective and more efficient for the overall enhancement of good governance. Now, you may ask, why is this important? Now, this is important because E-governance ensures that, or it creates arrangements to ensure that 
the benefits of all interventions by the government would reach the intended targets at the right time, in the right way, and to the right persons. And I will capture one of the themes in this year's budget um, with this statement. Now, the government spoke about digital technologies, and I would mainly be focusing on the areas of digital te technologies and trade, because these are major areas. And one of, the, one of the reasons is that these areas actually can be implemented or can be observed across several sectors. So basically they are cross-cutting sectors, right? So with this budget, I thought about one question, you know, how can digital technologies ensure the reach and accountability and provide the dish data to measure the impact of the policies. Now, like Stephanie, I would have noticed one thing that the budget was not very data driven. And with a heavy, heavy focus on digital technology, I believe that, you know, that takes away from one of the advantages of digitizing an economy. So what you have is that you have sectors, you have the budget um, being allocated to certain sectors. But what I realized is that it is not very for root and it's a bit vague. Vague in that, for one, let's look at trade. So one of the highlights of the digital technology was the software, the software for the ease of trade um, that was given. And I can't remember the name exactly, but it was basically a software that would basically manage the country's um, trade data and in terms of um, lessening the, the amount of paperwork. And that is something that we know the digital technologies can do. Digital technologies can lessen the amount of people work. But how is that effective also? Digital technologies not only lessens the amount of paperwork, but it gives direct it sends direct data to the necessary data instruments so that it can be analyzed. One of the things that I've noticed also with that, yes, we have that information, but there are broader challenges. There are broader challenges that we must take into consideration. For instance, in the area of trade again, yes, we speak about digital technologies and how um, the, the, the software will, um, is one of the first in the, in the Caribbean or the OECS, one of the first in the OECS and how it would ease um, trade and make it easier to manage. But one of the challenges that has been identified through Caribbean assessments and different Caribbean articles and different Caribbean organizations is that we have poor trade infrastructure within the Caribbean. And that affects both our imports and exports. And by poor trade infrastructure that can be broken down into the management of the capacity of volumes of trade that we get. We are not able at the present moment to manage the large, large volumes of trade in terms of imports or exports. So yes, we have the digital technologies that address in one area, but in another sense, we like the human capacity, which goes back to human resources. And in another sense, we also lack the ability to collect the necessary data to kind of create an analysis for change within the sector. So that's just an example of how vague, how vague some of the details are within this budget, you know, because whilst it addresses this specific challenge 
but this specific challenge is a part of a broader issue and it does not entirely speak to how that that one change would bring a positive change to the broader issue so this is my first day for the night i'm leaving the rest of the discussion open for the other panelists to give their contributions Thank you very much, Imana. I believe that you brought across some salient points, especially in regards to e-governance and the digitization of the economy. I think as young people right now, these are things we want to hear because we are in an age where we've been in an age where we are moving away from the traditional and archaic styles of conducting business and we're moving into a new platform, a new style where the online is really the way to go. So thank you for that. We'll be moving on to our in-house panelists and we begin with Mr. Landon. Okay, thank you very much, um, Mr. Moderator. I want to also extend um, very uh, initial congratulatory remarks um, to the two online panelists as they have really started off the discussion and opened up our minds significantly, uh, particularly as it pertains to the um, issue of statistics regionally. I'm just coming back from a regional conference on drug use prevention, and we are seeing that there is a significant issue across the Caribbean region where, where statistics are, are concerned. <laughs> and it's, it begs the question as to why are we afraid of numbers? Um, and why So, um, as I was saying, that a lot of um, funding agencies um, tend to inquire as it relates to how does this statistically apply to your country. So it is very important, and this is something I think, while it has not been outlined within the budget particularly or specifically, it is something that should be taken into consideration as it pertains to statistics and the Central Statistics Office should not only be focused on a national census every five years, in my opinion, but every 10 years, but um, and take another 10 years to review the information, but it should be um, focused on developing programs to get information and make it readily available so it can be applied to the the day-to-day -day of what's going on. So I just wanted to start that off, and it also takes me to my theme beyond numbers and I, i'm stealing it from <laughs> from um tonight but it it really is what this is all about beyond numbers recognizing that a budget is much more than numbers it's much more than um we want to spend this much money it's the practicality of spending money on certain things and my focus, uh, while I could speak about 101 things, I have focused on the youth sector and the health sector, two sectors that are very important to me. Um, the youth de demographic re represents the future of our nation. And uh, while I say that, I tend to disagree with persons for saying it because we are the now, um, but it's still we still need to recognize that for us to develop ourselves and develop our country, we have to recognize that we are the ones who have to be facing this country and even if we move um and this is a call to persons who choose to move as opposed to staying to build it is about recognizing that this is our country and nobody's going to build it for us but us so we have to try our best to do as much as possible to do the necessary things now this budget in terms of the or original 
or the initial view, um, Emana went into the five pillars that would have been analyzed. And many persons have reached out to me and said to me, file as if we do nothing for you in the, in the budget. Um, what do you think going to say about that? So now, initially, I was like, okay, um, let me take in, let me, let me look at it because I wanted, I, while I was there physically um, for the initial presentation, I cannot say that I had a full, I, I was able to fully digest what was being presented. But a further look into the budget, I want us to recognize that when we talk about youth, the National Youth Council currently states youth or describes youth as young persons or young citizens of Dominica ages 16 to 35. So it's a wide demographic and it's something that quite frankly we have not touched in a very long time in terms of our actual demographic of the National Youth Council. But when we look at the, the five pillars and we talk about more effective governance and we talk about how does that apply to young persons? We have young professionals who are, in fact, part and parcel of the government system who do need to be part and parcel of this process. And there are opportunities that I that I see that can come from this individual um, pillar that for young people can benefit. Now, public service modernization and transformation. We heard about the, the public service um, modernization in terms of the reclassification and the number of, 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 of potential for the the increase in salaries based on the in state and scales of many public officers, of which a number of young persons do fall within those categories. So I, we also need to take that into consideration when we take into to say boldly that young people will not benefit from this, from these programs. Great, greater focus on the productive sector. And at present, when we talk about the productive sector, we talk about a number of different um, sects that are currently going on and, and programs that are going on within the country, as well as productive young people who are doing the different um, activities within Dominica. And we have to be very careful when we look at this. So we have to take into consideration the resources that have been applied to these and see how exactly they do, in fact, relate to young persons, because young people do make up a significant part of the reproductive sector. And strengthen social protect protection. One of the things that falls under that is the enhancing the health system and program focusing on prevention, particularly with the non-communicable diseases. And many young persons live their lives up until they get into 40, and that's when get up to the age of 40 and that's when they start thinking about CNCDs and start talking about whether or not this is um, something that is focused um, or I should focus on um, and I say that to mean that we as a nation need to target our approaches to healthcare as a holistic approach as opposed to start stop focusing on we are treating persons with hypertension or treating persons with diabetes if we recognize that prevention is, a, is the first line defense to CNCDs, starting the prevention mechanisms from the, young, from the younger persons, from our 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 year olds, and preaching to them the preventative measures that can be implemented from those ages, I think in the long run, and, and not only me, but the World Health Organization supports, that we will have a stronger and more formidable attack on CNCDs in the long run as, as it and will reduce our fiscal expenditure on healthcare as it, as it pertains to CNCD um, prevention. And financial stability is also something where young people can benefit from. But we also, I within the youth sector, I have highlighted two areas in which in both under, sorry, both under the youth sector and health sector, I have outlined positive aspects as well as areas for improvement within the budget. So now for the positive aspects on the youth sector, I was happy to see that there was an increase in the budgetary allocation for the Ministry of Youth, which is something that was um, in uh, the 2021 to 2022 budget, we saw um, allocation of, uh, and I don't want to be incorrect, Yes, I want to give the exact figure. 
we saw budgetary allocation um, within the Ministry of Health, an increase of last year was 59.3 million. And uh, this year we're seeing a budgetary allocation of 73 million. So there has been an increase um, towards the Ministry of Health as well. Now, there was somewhat of a significant decrease to the Ministry of Youth. However, we noticed that the Ministry of Youth would have been separated from social services, which now has been um, bridged to the Ministry of Health. So we can recognize that there has also been some form of a shift in um, portfolios so that there is room for that. So those budgets allocate a commendable increase in um, in the funding for youth development programs, reflecting a commitment to nurturing the potential of young Dominicans. And we are excited to see that. And of course, we, the National Youth Council of Dominica, we're excited to continue to partner with the Youth Development Division and the other youth agencies across the island, specifically the Ministry of Youth, as we want to ensure that our programs are tailored to the benefit and upliftment of young people. I'm also excited to note, and not necessarily specifically outlined with the budget, but also from the budget presentations from the other um, parliamentarians, we heard many references to digital literacy, which is something that is of um, importance and it's very timely and essential. Areas for improvement, I have not seen and have not heard within this year's budget and something that is of great concern for me and like and I'd like to go on the record to state that youth mental health has not been something that was outlined um while while it acknowledges it or uh, while there has been mention of it um importance of mental more dedicated funding is needed for specialized youth mental health services. Just weeks ago, a young man would have taken his own life within our own country. And this is something that we that is close, that's quickly reaching home. So um, we have to take into consideration that this is not something that is only happening on the outside, but it's happening within our country. And we need to take a more targeted approach to this. And youth participation in decision making is another room for improve, um, improvement for us. We have been very excited to be participating within a number of the um, budgetary uh, budgetary discussions this year. We unfortunately were not able to have met with the Ministry of Finance prior to the budget, but we are still open, and I'm saying it publicly. We are still open to have discussion with the Ministry of Finance because the this is something that we think is very important for us to be engaged within. We are also happy that we have been engaged with the um, Sir Dennis Byron report. Um, just before coming here today, actually, um, I got a letter inviting us to a consultation on the 21st, I believe. So it's something and other young persons will be present. And just quickly to wrap up, uh, I know Mr. and Madam Moderator are very strict to the time. Um, but with regards to, we've seen significant health infrastructure investments over the years, as well as our disease prevention programs. Infrastructure is one thing, but we also need to strengthen our health workforce development. While the budget reflects an increased commitment to training but and, capaci and capacity building, there exists a need for further emphasis on the capacity building of our health professionals. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and I am glad you ended on that health note. And we're going to come back to preventative health care. Because one of the things that I am not seeing, which is quite questionable, is the establishment of physiotherapy in our health and wellness centers. So we're going to come back to that as a way of reducing NCDs, of course. But we're going to come back to that. Let's head over to Ashma. Ashma, let me just remind you, it's seven minutes. Okay, so you will get notified when you have uh, five minutes, three minutes, and one minute left. I like that the rules are applying now from me. <laughs> are you trying to say something, Wendy? So good evening again to everyone, and I am very happy to be part of the panel. As I said before, I must echo the sentiments of the panelists before me. I was thinking for some time as it relates to theme, and it just took me back to the 
current theme, resetting to ensure the judicious use of government's limited resources. Feels like it was taken out from an economics textbook. But limited resources, yes. Judicious, yes. Um, Stephanie spoke um, in regards to migration. Fire spoke about health and, you know. But I love the words that have been used before. We've heard about the national reset. We've heard about building a dynamic Dominica. Um, when we think about reset, we think about transformation. I think that the words that have been used have been the appropriate use of words. However, the policies that have been proposed have not matched the potential themes of the budget. And so I would not change the theme. I feel the theme is very fitting. There needs to be metamorphose. There needs to be transformation of the economy. I mean, all economies are transforming across the globe. And so that's what's necessary for Dominica as well. Um, and so this leads me to the review of the budget from a youth perspective, because that's what we were asked to discuss. And last year, as second vice president Winston mentioned, the pre, sorry, first, I apologize, the pre-budget consultations, I saw many of the discussions that we, and the propositions that we had at the pre-budget consultation within this budget. So it means that obviously they're listening to you voices. I, I wish it was not verbatim in some cases, but I appreciate that it was included nonetheless. And with the prolonged fiscal roller coaster that continues to ride Dominica, the announcement in the budget did not exceed my expectations. The proposals are aligned with raising employment and output prospects in the medium term. But in my own perspective, the policies were fairly targeted and limited in scope. Some of the key takeaways for me were, were one, looking at the housing sector. The government made mention to 500 lots for public officers, continued 10,000 housing grant to assist young persons 40 and under with their first homes, and construction of 344 homes. And one of the pillars identified in the reset was effective governance. And I, I was hoping that there would have been an alignment of effective governance and these homes that we're building. Because I feel specifically there needs to be stronger oversight as it relates to the implementation of, these, of projects like these. And I think um, Ms. Pascal actually mentioned it in her own um, contributions online as it relates to, you know, we're building these homes, but what about the sustainability aspect of these homes? The second point, or the second key takeaway for me was educational reform. And this is dear to me as a tertiary education um, instructor and involved in the educational sector. I really don't want to follow suit from some parliamentarians because I know we've said it a lot this evening, a lot of baseless statements are spewed in the house many times. Lack of evidence, no data. Um, but the Dominican education system is based on an objective to get marks in examinations with lack of practical knowledge. So I see students every day coming to Dominica State College, and to be quite honest, when they leave Dominica State College, employers are calling me and asking, well, I mean, these students are not necessarily ready for the work world. They're not ready. And that's because we emphasize so much on testing and examinations with little to no practical knowledge, lack of internships. And I mean, this is something that is experienced across the entire region. So it's not homogenous to Dominica. It's experienced everywhere. However, I feel like there is a lack of effort that is being made to somewhat um, reform the educational sector. And so I'm, I'm quite pleased to see reform in this budget. I would have loved to see more discussion beyond what the OECS poll is doing because they are investing heavily across the Caribbean region in reforming education. However, what are we doing? Are we, are we just piggybacking off of what other institutions are doing? Because while Pearl may be establishing its research and they may be you know, driving data, the fact remains that the experiences of Jamaican, Antiguan, um, Trinidadian, Bar Barbadian students are going to be not far different. 
it's not going to be a large disparity, but we are going to have differences. And so it's necessary to ensure that if we're reforming, we're reforming in the context of Dominica as well. Agriculture. Last year was an agricultural budget. That's what it was called. Um, I remember sitting on a panel with Dr. Henderson as well, Dr. Jajak, post-budget, discussing the budget of 2022. And I was very shocked to see the aspiration. I think it's a very, <laughs> it's a very, <laughs> it's a very ambitious. I mean, I really uh, applaud the government for you know, the aim to increasing agriculture to contribute 700 million by 2030. But when we look at the allocation, it's merely 7 million in 2023. We're looking at 7 million investment this year, perhaps next year it might be another seven. And are we saying that seven is going to multiply to 700? I mean, I'm just being practical. And that's why we go back to this. I mean, many people have mentioned it, practicality. So when we look at this particular sector, the agricultural sector. And I mean, I applaud the Honorable Joseph for involving youth within agriculture through the establishment of NIO. However, in my own perspective, I believe that we need to do more as it relates to increasing um, adding value. I just saw a post today from Gaston Brown as it relates to the CRISPR plantain chips, and I saw a huge conversation around it. And I'm like, you know, we're exporting these plantains to these countries, and they're adding value to it. Why aren't we doing that here? But it was reference was made to the budget, and so I do look forward to seeing those aspirations met. Living standards. Inflation is expected to further increase for this year, but households are unlikely to sigh relief anytime soon. And we have high unemployment. We have underemployment as well among youth. Wages have not kept pace with inflation, um, and that's going to lead to a decrease in disposable incomes over the next year. However, I'm hopeful for public officers, as Mr. Lander indicated, they will be benefiting from a $9 million increase in the wage bill. And while I'm not privy to the actual number of youth who actually make up this particular subsection of the public sector and the labor force, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm quite hopeful that many will benefit, but at the same time, what about the persons who are outside of that public sector? Like, you know, how are, their, how are their realities being met with inflation happening in our country? I mean, people are not able to afford things. This is, this is the reality of things. And while persons may have the misperception that going to an event might necessarily, you know, is necessarily correlated, directly correlated to, you know, the realities of everyone. That in itself is not true. And that again goes back to that absence of data that exists in Dominica. Lastly, I'm sorry for going over time. Um, one particular point that I really want to speak about is the financial stability. I think that's an underlying um, notion that we need to discuss, GDP ratio. I mean, I can do an Econ 112 class quickly with you all to understand exactly the debt ratio, but I mean, if a country's ratio is 100%, that would mean its actual annual economic output is approximately equal to public debt. Dominica's is 104. That's where we're at, right? So, we're, so it's actually greater than the 100, right? And so I think they will come to a point about revenues and how we anticipate to decreasing the public public debt. Again, Ms. Pascal made mention to, you know, the, for example, the, little, the, the credit unions and um, the 5,000 US dollars and 8,000 US dollars that different investors will be paying. But in reality, like how, how are we somewhat going to close that margin as it relates to, you know, public debt and our GDP? And so these are some of the key takeaways. Um, the budget's focus was to reprioritize the government's agenda through the national reset, but I think there's a lack of substantive evidence and data driving policies, which everybody has mentioned already, and framing decisions contributing to development agenda, I do have a lack of conviction in the achievement of this reset being fully achieved. And that's where I end. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so I'll, I'll do my best to follow that. Um, I, think we, I think we have a really good mix. Um, I'm going to take a slightly different approach. Uh, you know, my, um, my you know, fellow panelists have spoken about different parts, the statistics, 
um, you know, f um, files honing on the, the health and the youth. Um, I'm going to, I think my contribution will be best focused near exclusively on the digital economy um, part of it. Uh, you know, I'm, I guess I'm a relatively, you know, smart guy or something, but <laughs> I, 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 I want to focus on where I have the most experience. Um, so, um, yeah, so, so to start at the highest level, the, the budget is, is organized into the five pillars, the more effective governance, public sec, um, service modernization and transformation, greater focus on productive se um, produ greater focus on the productive sector, strengthen social protection, and ensure financial stability. Yeah, but within pillar number two, public sector modernization, and within pillar number three, I think that's where the, eco the digital economy is, um, is classified. Uh, under pillar two, we have, it, well, it addresses digital training, because it talks about retooling in terms of the NEP, and then um, there's a sort of general digitalization, uh, digitize more services and systems. Um, so, yeah, that's, um, I mean, the, the first thing I would really say about that is I, I'm happy the government is, 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 you know, looking at this as a focus area to invest in. Um, uh, that's not something I think we should take for granted. Uh, it could easily not be done, and you know it needs to be applauded. I think, I, I mean, I think we all agree that this is very much the direction the, com the country needs to go in. Um, the 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 budget, a budget outlines, you know, well, the part I'm interested in is the expenditure, right? I'm I'm interested in what parts the what investments the government are go the government's going to make. Um, it outlines what's allocated. It doesn't outline what the execution will be. It can't do that. Um, that's the part I'm most interested in. Uh, I, I, that's not something against the budget. Just saying, you know, very clearly, there's the execution, and over the next year, I'll be paying attention to what's actually done, aside from the money that's allocated. Um, so yeah. So so as far as I'll start with what is outlined, and then I'll talk about what I would like to see. Um, so under public sector investments, which I guess was linked to pillar two, um, there's going to be digital systems introduced. Uh, so there's trade stream to, in, to streamline imports. I think that's really important. Um, there's gonna be the introduction of uh, health management and information systems among other systems, a unified um, identification uh, basically a, 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 a system to identify each citizen in the country and give them access to government services based on that. I think those are really, those are really interesting. And I mean, I recognize that you can only do so much in a year. And that sounds like a lot to, to introduce in a year. So again, I applaud that. Um, there's 15 state-of-the-art innovative hubs across the country. Um, well, we have those now, so, so you know, it will be, uh, again, the execution is the most important part. So, you know, that's something that's there, and I would be very interested in seeing what those are going to be used for. I think, um, you know, they should be used for training and potentially, you know, as free co-working spaces for businesses, but I'll get to, um, to recommendations in another part. Uh, there's also going to be the introduction of new legislation. So again, as a reminder, I'm just looking at what is there, and then we can go from that to what needs to be added, or what I think needs to be added. Um, so there's going to be new legislation um, that will be enacted in Parliament to ensure that digital and online transactions are adequately uh, protected by law. And then there's going to be grants of up to 27,000 EC to support digital technology. And the hope there is it will provide young people with an opportunity to unlock their potential and equip themselves with skills. Um, so, so yeah, overall, the expenditure, um, f the expenditure will be, recurrent expenditure will be 55 million, and the capital expenditure will be 138 million. So that's generally what the government has planned for the digital economy, or it's what I understood from, from reading the budget. Um, so, so, 
you know, it, the, the digital economy has some privacy in this budget. It has some primacy in this budget, right? Like, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a whole um, investment area. It's clearly linked to a range of the different pillars. Um, but I would say you can probably separate the investments in the digital economy into, well, I mean, you can, you can split it into a few ways, but, but one way to split it would be a digitalization of government services. That would make it easy to, easier to access those, like, you know, passport, et cetera. And another one would be creating a supportive environment for digital businesses. I would say that, like, it seems very much like it leans towards the former, it leans towards investments in um, digitalization of government services, and that's a good thing, right? Just about anything the government does that is an investment in the country is a good thing. But uh, if I were to change that, I would definitely lean more towards um, creating a supportive environment for digital businesses. When we talk about the digital economy, remember an economy is made up of, well, a simple way to look at it is there's businesses and there's consumers, right? Like, so ultimately we're talking about how are those consumers gonna link to those businesses in a way that creates more opportunities, more jobs, it helps businesses to grow, it pulls more money in. That's not going to come from digitalization of government services. The digitalization of government services is going to lead to um, easier living within the country, which is a good thing. But, you know, as myself who's running a digital business, um, and from what I imagine is meant when we talk about building a digital economy, we must be talking about the latter. So if we talk about the latter, you know, some concrete things I would want to see are, you know, a focus on digital skills training. Um, um, e talk, uh, talk about how we'll enable digital consumption, right? Like um, targeting of digital contracts to local firms, um, larger grants to finance digital businesses. Y you know, uh, it's, it's not too, it's, it's relatively simple if you think about it, right? Like again, there's consumers and there's businesses. So if we're talking about communities in the country that don't have internet, then they just can't consume from digital businesses. So if, you, if you're looking at creating an enabling environment for digital businesses, then one approach would be to you know, ensure those persons have access to internet, ensure they have access to, um, to cheap data plans, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, if, if we look at digital businesses, again, well, I mean, it's simple to me. They, o they only have a small set of inputs. Um, they need technologists to, be, to create the infrastructure of digi those digital businesses. Um, they need um, access to supporting digital infrastructure like telecoms, like, um, like um, easy payment processing, um, logistical infrastructure if they connect to the physical world like my business does. Um, and, you, and of course, they need to be financed. So, so while I see these things, I see, you know, I see, I see elements of the budget that, that are advantageous to the digital economy, I can't really say it, it, it seems to me like it will change the, the, the level to which the environment is enabling. Um, and I'll be happy to speak to those throughout the rest of the, um, the, rest of the session tonight. Thank you so much, Davidson. I think we have touched on a lot of youthful issues, but I want to get a big dog out of the way, which is something that was not mentioned, which is electoral reform. And we know that is quite a popular discussion um, in Dominica right now. I want to ask a question. I want to pose this question to at least two of the panelists. I'm not going to ask all of you. How might the modernization of the electoral system encourage greater participation of young people in the political process? And what budgetary allocations do you think will support this? So I'm gonna pose that question to one online and one in person. Um, Emana, online, you can begin and then we'll take a response. Okay, can you hear me now? 
Okay, great. Okay, so like I mentioned, one of the th one of the issues that was not mentioned was electoral reform, and we know it's quite a popular discussion in Dominica uh, currently. So my question to get this out of the way, how might the modernization of the electoral system encourage greater participation of young people in the political process? And what budgetary allocations would support that? To, to get more young people to take part in the electoral process. And by taking part in the electoral process, um, does it mean their participation within politics as leaders going up for, for um, politics? Or does it mean they are participating in the campaign? Or does it mean that they are just voting so that's a very broad question then um my take on this is that you know at the end of the day i think that young people should be involved in the electronic um electoral process how can we capture the young audience to take take part in it i think there are several factors that we should take into consideration Firstly, who are the young people are we targeting to participate? Because, and the reason why I ask this question is that, you know, there are a lot of young people in Dominica who study abroad, right? There are a lot of young people in Dominica who study abroad, and there are a lot of young people in Dominica on the outside of Dominica um, for whatever reasons that may be concerning. Um, I can remember back in, university uh, during election seasons. Um, I can remember during the Bahamian elections, during the Bahamian elections, persons living outside or living in Barbados for, from the Bahamas could vote because their electoral ele electoral system afforded them the opportunity to vote even if they are outside of the country because they had a modernized process and that is one of the ways that you can i i see i see that you can engage more young people to vote because when you look at the the youth age for voting that is 18 to 45 these are development periods of a young person's life. And a lot of young people, and I cannot even say that because I don't have the statistics, but based on observation and, you know, based on probably secondary data, you know that that is a point, a period in time where a lot of young people seek opportunity, um, be it employment or education. So they're not necessarily involved within the country itself. So that is just one aspect that can be looked at in terms of the electoral system. Another thing is that modernization of the system can also mean technology and technology application. Um, is it that we want to be um, able to vote via online? Do we have the necessary um, capital capacity to implement such measure, you know, and that takes a lot of money. I will, I will just guess that it takes some, a lot of money. Um, using the budgets of um, other islands who have implemented national ID, 
um, policies and actually new national IDs, identification cards that can be used across different sectors, be it health, um, be it in terms of licensing, taxes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there is a heavy cost to it. And not only is there a heavy cost to it, there's a lot of hurdles that may come across um, into the actual Im implementation of the, the plan. I can speak for, um, in, in Barbados' case, there was a lot of um, problems that they came across in actually rolling all the new identification cards. And they're still, they're still um, you know, having issues with it because the, the cards purpose is for a multitude of things. And I guess that's the same type mm -hmm. of, and I guess it's time to, <laughs> I guess it's that, <laughs> it's the same type of approach we are taking in Dominica. So I, I, I cannot exactly say the budget that should be allocated on it. I think it's, a, it's going to be a large one, but I think it's something that we need to roll out smartly and that we need to engage the public on, and especially the young people, in terms of what is the best way forward in terms of getting them involved in it. Testing. Thank you, Emana. And that is 0 0.7 million um, estimated. Let me just use that word. I pose the same question to you, Ashman. Just coming out from Emana's discussion, what is it about this discussion on electoral reform that young people are so disengaged from? I really hoped you wouldn't have asked me that question, Wendy. But I will be very honest in my response as it relates to electoral reform. Um, more importantly, what I want to focus on is youth engagement in the political process. Because before, you, I mean, we're talking about electoral reform, reports have been conducted, um, solutions have been proposed. I mean, this discussion has been ongoing and it has been dragged for too many years. But as it relates to youth participation in, politi in the political process, we're seeing many youth are disengaged. They're not necessarily participating in voting. And we have to ask why. I've mentioned it before. I mean, in the last two years, I've mentioned that many youth are just hopeless. They do not necessarily trust um, politicians. And so when politicians speak and say that they're going to execute this and they don't, you find many youth are not necessarily uh, hopeful in you know, the prospects for them, and therefore, they do not engage in political processes. It's simple as that. Um, as it relates to electoral reform, I believe that voter registration in the 21st century, we have to advocate to have specific reform can, that can definitely contribute to increasing voter turnout, right? Um, we've mentioned it before. In 2019, I conducted research in the UK it was based on return, the return migration nexus. And return migration, while we talk about migration, I think it's even more necessary for us to discuss return migration because many people have left. Over 100% of the population lives outside of Dominica. Fact. I'm not arguing with anyone. Um, and it's a concern because if you have so many people living out, right, we talk about the human capital that is necessary to develop the country. Now, in the context of voting, are we open to a conversation to say that with modernization of electoral reform, that citizens who live outside of Dominica should be eligible to be, votes, to be voting, should be sending absentee votes back to Dominica considering such a large number of people live outside of Dominica? Are we ready for that kind of conversation? You know, because I mean, we've been discussing, you know, rolling out ID cards and um, cleaning out the voters list. But it spans beyond that, to be honest, especially because we have so many people living outside who are, in part, contributing some way to development in Dominica. Um, and then we have students who for, example, who, for example, may have gone off to study for six months, a year, two years, and they potentially, I mean, based on the law, um, they potentially could uh, qualify to vote. And so what about their vote? Does their vote not count? if we're talking about the realm of modernization. Um, I believe, though, that, like I said, it's not a, we're not trying to shy away from electoral reform, 
but young people are just not necessarily trusting politicians and therefore they're not necessarily um, interested in participating in political discussion and discourse. That's my take on this. Thank you very much, Ashma. Um, a question to the hmm, that's a that's a good one. Um, okay, well, I'll try to break that into the two parts you mentioned there, which is how. You know, how can it be relevant to young people and what will allow us to be globally competitive? Um, interestingly, I think those two are linked. Um, yeah. So, I mean, okay, if you imagine the journey of a young person participating in the, in the digital economy, right? Um, the truth is they're going to start off uh, with less resources than an older person and they're going to, um, they're probably gonna make more mistakes. Uh, both of those things I think would, would point to the need for the environment to be very supportive, right? That way their mistakes, you know, perhaps when they fall, they'll, they'll, fall, they'll, they'll fall only a little bit or there'll be many ways they can retry, right? I mean, just, we, we, again, we can really just think of it, right? as someone who starts uh, a, a, a digital consulting business, a digital marketing business, they're writing software for someone, what does that person need? Um, but what's w the, the reason I said I, I think that's linked to making us competitive is because the things that would assist them are those things that make us competitive, right? And um, those things are generally limiting the cost that that person needs to spend um, figuring out innovative ways to subsidize the spend that that person must have, um, perhaps making it easy for that person to access the market. Those are the things that are a, gonna mean that you know an 18 year old that starts a digital business has a higher chance of success, and b gonna mean that if there's someone like myself with lots of you know credentials or experience in tech that they're gonna choose to do that business in Dominica rather than the UK or St. Lucia. Now, to get concrete, because I'm talking at a higher level, I'm talking ab about many of the things I mentioned earlier, right? Um, uh, in the UK where I was previously, I was working out of a co-working space, right? A co-working space is a very simple way for, um, for you know, a government or a large business to subsidize small, businesses that have just started, right? They basically don't need to pay as much rent. You can just think of it like that, right? Like, so if uh, you are a digital marketer and let's say you're, um, you are, you know, you're just starting off, you're just you, trying to get your first client or you just have your first client, then maybe you could work at one of these innovation hubs that have been opened, right? So that, that, that's a really simple thing. Now, one key thing I want to put in here is the existence of the innovation hub doesn't mean that that's how it's going to be used, right? That's why I spoke about execution earlier. But, you know, co-working co co spaces is a very simple one. Another one is, you know, yes, you can cut into their course like that. You can cut into their course by also making it easy to do all of the admin around starting up a business. Again, this makes it very easy for young people and it makes the environment very competitive, right? Uh, many times I've spoken about how I registered my company both in Dominica and in the UK. And in the UK, I think it costs me something like 50 pounds and an hour. And in Dominica, it costs me a uh, thousand US and many weeks, right? And I, I thought that was a terrible experience, but I've been in Dominica for three years that was a good experience, right? Like relative to what the usual experiences are here doing business, you know? So uh, we cannot speak about competitiveness and we cannot speak about business success when people have few resources if we don't speak about what is the business environment like truly. This isn't a political thing. It's like, you know, I mean, if you, anyone who is trying to do business here knows it is not a supportive environment in that way, right? So, um, so you can try to cut into their course like that 
And another approach, you know, you really can, I, I like to keep things simple. Think of cutting cost and think of adding to their, um, you know, to their account lines, to their top lines. So what, what can they spend, right? And again, there are a few ways you can do this. Um, and you know, that's what finance is, right? Like, so you can, um, you can give grants to, um, to businesses that start up. Many times I've spoken about, um, I met an official from the Botswana government, and what Botswana um, was doing back in 2020 is they'd allocated, I think, about a million US a year, and they were giving that to 10 businesses a year. So the, uh, the, the government had, um, had set up uh, this external, no, actually not really, it's not that much, because they're gonna burn through that so fast, right? But the, <laughs> Well, that, that's the point. <laughs> so, so the government set up this external um, separate, you know, a body of experts that would run a, a challenge every year, you know, with local businesses and upstarts or existing businesses that were, you know, competing for that financing. They take part in the competition. If they won, they got like 100,000 um, uh, US, right? Like, and you can, it doesn't take much thinking to imagine what having 100,000 US um, in your account would mean for your chances of running a business here. It just means you know, you're probably gonna make the same mistakes I made, but you will have more tries to succeed. And I, I'm really, like, I think it takes a lot of, I think re expertise comes through when you can think of things simply, right? And that's why I'm trying to focus on things simply, because I really want people to understand what I'm talking about, right? It's, it's not a, yes, it's a high level policy, but at the base level where that person is experiencing it, it's gonna come down to how much do I have to spend, how much do I have to spend, and, and how much must I spend, right? Um, there, just to list a, a few of the policies um, that could come in, um, one really interesting one is purposeful contracting, right? When the procurement of services is done, um, you can do it in such a way that it creates lots of op opportunities locally. So um, I mentioned earlier that I think there's a bit of an overfocus on building digital services rather than creating an enabling environment for digital businesses, right? Two very separate things. But you can link those two. If you source part of the, you know, the contract to build a digital service from a local company, whether that's the initial execution, whether that's the support contracts, then what you do is you immediately just magically create opportunities here, right? You're going to spend $10 million on this anyway, but what if you decide you must spend part of that 10 million on, like, on local businesses? Then all of a sudden, even if it's 10%, that means, yes, you're gonna get the thing, but a million is gonna enter the economy, right? So, that's one way because contracts are a very interesting, contracts can be viewed as a means of financing as well as you know, grants, loans, equity investment. So, I mean, just to wrap up, those, those are, that's, you know, that's just a sample of policies that would A, make it likely for someone who was starting out and who was a youth. The, 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 the bit about them being a youth really just means they have less resources, they have, more, they have less experience, they are more likely to fail. So if we want them to succeed, the environment needs to be very good, right? And, and in making it very good, we also make it very competitive. Yeah. Thank you so much. I know we could be here all evening. I would have asked the audience to work with their sleeping bags, but in the interest of time, I want to pose a question to Phil, um, something that you mentioned in your opening remarks. I want you to shed light on the issue of mental health among young people in Dominica. And because sometimes when I, as a young person, look or listen to the budget presentation, one of the things that I am hoping for is that the, the various ministries would actually supplement um, some of the policies that are being mentioned in the budget, expound on how these things are going to, Im Im going to be implemented and some of the plans that are going to be initiated.
I think you got the question. Yeah. So I got the question, and I want everyone to just look at it from this perspective. Nobody asks a hypertensive a question when they say, I don't want salt in my meal. Nobody asks a diabetic a question when they say, I don't put sugar in my tea, and I haven't put sugar in my tea years. We need to treat mental health as what it is, a health issue. And as a result, it has almost become almost a taboo when we start talking about mental health. People start to go up in arms and start to um, go into their shell because they're so afraid to realize that all of us, all of us, suffer from some form of a mental health issue. I think half of the parliamentarians that I heard speak um, have, uh, can be diagnosed with some form of a mental health issue. But, but I mean, practically, when you look about, <laughs> and I see Mr. Paris laughing, but it's true. <laughs> because, and now we're laughing, but it's not a joke. It's not a joke. It's not a joke because mental health is an issue that we have to focus on. Mental health is not only the issue of vagrancy of people walking on the side of the road. It's ADHD, not being able to keep her thoughts when you are speaking and not being able to, to stick to a point when you are talking and you're going here, there, and everywhere. That is a diagnostic tool that is used to diagnose persons with ADHD. Anxiety as well, not being able to stand up and speak. You see persons fumbling with their paper. I'm, and I say people are laughing, but it is actually a practical thing. So when you sit down and look at Parliament, and I'm just saying it, and use Parliament as an example to, to, to put it into perspective. Sorry. <laughs> to put it into perspective, look at the parliamentarians the next time and think about it. ADHD, anxiety, depression, these things are, th that are, and for example, in the international world, we hear about people like Robin Williams, who suffered of depression, and who used to smile more than Robin Williams in his movies. You understand? So persons need to recognize that depression, uh, that mental health issues are issues that we need to start talking about. And you see how I quickly put it in perspective for you guys on something that's very simple and something very practical. And that's what I'm talking about, practical approaches involving the discussion in our health and family life education programs. Ashma made, made um, um, reference to it in terms of the modernization of our educational system. Our young people are being trained to sit CXC. At the end of the day, when they go out into the world, like the soft skills, being able to communicate, being able to deal with other people's emotions, emotional intelligence, being able to recognize... <laughs> 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 but I just want us to recognize that it is something for us to take into consideration. And the same way that I can sit down and I can look at a person from head to toe and and probably try to say, okay, you look like you may have a thyroid issue, you look like you may have a, a liver issue, you need to lose weight, you need to gain weight, you need to eat less of this, you need to eat more of that. That is the problem with mental health issues. You cannot look at a person most times and quickly diagnose them because most persons hide who they are because of fear of stigma. It has become the HIV of the modern day. Right? People are more open to discuss or, or accept someone with, a, with HIV because, hey, you can't die of HIV than someone who has a mental issue right now. And it is, it's actually a fact. So we have to recognize that health and wellness is a holistic approach, and I'm very happy. And when Neil also made a reference to it in terms of the, um, the, the physical physical therapy aspect it's something that I think that in the long term needs to be taken into consideration persons do not need to come to Roseau to ac to access all of these uh, medical um, adjunct services um, I think we should seek to open clinics but that also means that persons who have gone overseas to specialize in these fields need to come back home to support so I, 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 I want to, to make reference to that and uh, just, uh, I think it's about time for our final comments, so I can just go into that one time? Not yet? Okay, cool. Can I just, add a key, just a brief. I just want to add briefly, very briefly as well, that this was a key aspiration from our last budget um, consultation. We proposed that at the clinics, you know, you go to the clinic 
and you should be able to see a mental health nurse, you know, um, because statistically, most doctors, they only have 3% of their training in mental health, and so they may not be able to address someone who's coming in who may have that. And within the same budget, within social protection, it makes reference to, <laughs> to the care of our juveniles, to the care of persons who come in conflict with the law, and I don't see that necessarily being reflected in policy. And so I'm hoping that, you know, it's not dropping on deaf ears. I see that we have a parliamentarian with us, so I'm hoping that he will take it back to parliament because this is a concern that young people are currently faced with. We're seeing it on the streets. I mean, if we drive through Rosa tonight, we'll see another new face of a young man or young woman. And so it is a detrimental issue that we're faced with today, right? And so I really hope that um, moving forward, it is something that is um, taken into greater consideration as it relates to addressing um, youth issues in Dominica. Thank you. Okay, so this question is for Stephanie. Um, can you hear me clearly? Yes. All right, so you spoke earlier to the rise in the cost of living and inflation and so on with regards to the economy and not much can be done, but what policy do you think can be implemented to address the increase in the cost of living? What can be used to at least somewhat mitigate the blow of the increase in the cost of living? I know it's a, it's a tough question, probably. I saw Ashma open her eyes for me, but I believe you'll be able to respond to that. Um, that is a tough question. <laughs> as I would have said, um, as price takers, as we are known, we really have little influence over inflationary pre um, press pressures, prices. So re-entry, the most the government can do, and they have been doing it to an extent, is kind of focus on internal growth, internal um, produce. So again, in agriculture, they actually want to substitute 15% um, of, of our import bill um, with local produce. So that is actually one, that is a great way of reducing the prices. But even then, to some degree, you still, as a citizen, will, will still feel the shock because um, in terms of when we get in the different machinery, when we import in the different, um, when we import in different machinery, when we import in the different um, fertilizers, for instance, obviously too, we can use natural fertilizers and those type of things. But in terms of a policy geared at strictly battling inflation is, is, is really not much the government can do unless the government decides to um foot the cost themselves so in terms of providing subsidies and and they then bear the cost but again that would lead to we already have a public debt issue so them doing that is just going to lead us into greater financial instability so um there's different measures in terms of taxes and, and those types of things. But again, the government would have to foot the cost. They would have to, to foot the bill. And so while we as a people, we would get um, a bit of a reprise in the immediate run, but in the medium to long term, in the, in the medium to long term, we go into fleet again. Um, thankfully for us, though, the IMF, um, they recently put out the the world economic outlook and global pressures are in, inflationary pressures are set to decline. So um, that is that is a good sign in terms of uh, for the global economy. Um, these pressures would have started back in 2021 um, because of the disruption to the the global supply chain caused by COVID-19, and then further it was further. Um, affected by the Russian Ukraine war, um, especially considering that Russia is one of the biggest producers of oil and gas, and Ukraine is one of the largest producers of wheat. And so two, we see that two variables that by and large determine our consumer price index, which is food and gas, 
we see it affected on both sides. So there's not much the government can do in that regard. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, but again, there is other things that they can do in terms of increasing how we're able to impact it in terms of increasing our disposable income, in terms of um, trying to spark the economy in some way so that even though, yes, prices are high, yes, we have to go for inflation, but it's not a case where it's such a large burden that we are unable to feel that you know, we can make it from day to day. Um, there are different things. So, and I, I really like the fact that what, <laughs> I really like the fact that what Ashma said is that the, the implementation of a lot of these different policies, that is where um, this administration tends to fall short. Um, and even to this is a recurring budget, is, is the same major sectors we see, the same major sectors we see being highlighted and focused on. but the government needs to put a greater emphasis on other areas of the sector because there are a lot of people who do not fit into the broad scope of education and, and agriculture and, and these types of sectors, and we need to account for them as well. So even in terms of our entertainment industry, there's no really real mention of that made um, within the budget. Even in terms of sports, I felt that sports was lacking. Um, we see again the the introduction or the mention of this sports council that was mentioned about two three budgets ago and it has not come to actually it has not actualized as yet um so in terms of directly tackling inflation there is not much they can do but in terms of equipping us with the tool so that we can battle the inflation that is i think where their their focus and their efforts should be geared towards Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pascal. I believe that was an awesome attempt at the question. You really highlighted some salient points there. Yeah. Just quickly, um, I want to, quickly. quickly, very quickly, I want persons to, because clearly my comment may have offended a few persons on the live. Um, I just want people to recognize that my statements are in fact data-driven. I have shared on the online comments a link to an article that makes a correlation to politicians and mental health issues. So it is actually something that is an international issue. And I didn't say it for people laughed within the room. People laughed within the room, but it was not a joke. So I just wanted to put that point out there and go on record to indicate that my comment was in fact data driven. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Oh, Lord. Okay. Thank you for that clarification, <laughs> Fayo. Before we, before we move on to accepting questions from the audience and from online, just one critical question, which I think should not have taken us by surprise, which is pillar number five. And that relates to the government ensuring financial stability. This question I'm going to pose to Ashma, and it's sort of like a two-part question. I am very interested in hearing your thoughts on how the budget addresses debt sustainability. And secondly, the introduction of all these revenue expectations. Do you think that they may be a bit over optimistic given the outlook for commodity prices, which we know will continue to remain reasonably high? Okay, so it's a two part question. The first part, share your thoughts on the 
budget on how the budget addressed debt sustainability and two given the introduction of these revenue expectations do you think that they they may be a bit over optimistic given the outlook for commodity prices which we know will remain reasonably high okay thank you so much for that question because it was one of my key takeaways um, from the introduction as I mentioned and I made reference to the GDP debt ratio um, being over 100 percent I mean high debt implies a drag on growth and some of the well <laughs> the reset will focus on debt sustainability and in my own perspective I do not necessarily feel like that was sufficiently addressed within the budget itself um, much of the statistics online and I have a, a problem with that as well because when you talk about Latin America and the Caribbean the population of Latin Mer America is far super <laughs> I mean it's much higher than the Caribbean and so when we get lumped into that particular subsection um, sometimes the statistics are not necessarily reflective of the true realities of us in the Caribbean but the pre-pandemic debt levels have grown right and Caribbean countries have to strive especially in Dominica we have to strive to negotiate and obtain the highest level of debt restructure and relief that is possible um, the considerable, considerable magnitude of fiscal effort that is necessary to address debt sustainability in Dominica has to look at, I would say, somewhat, um, it has to be consistent with fiscal solvency. It has, to, it, it has to call for more fiscal consolidation programs, which I don't think is evident within our own um, economy. I mean, I stand on what I say. And the authorities that are responsible for formulating these policies need to be convinced that the current level of excessive debt is severely restricting the use of fiscal policy, and that is also negatively affecting economic growth in Dominica. Um, and so I, I look forward to some consolidation programs that will, be, that will be pitched. I know that some Caribbean countries have done some debt consolidation, um, including Dominica. However, clearly, it has not worked in our favor because we are seeing debt increasing over, the, over time. To your next part, as it relates to revenues, in my own opinion, I feel like we need to be more innovative, right? Um, while I applaud the government for the recommendations for the different revenue generation streams that they have proposed, I also believe that there needs to be greater innovation with regards to revenue generation in Dominica. Um, Tony hinted to some points within the digital economy earlier, but I want to make specific mention to the entrepreneurial ecosystem because youth unemployment is a serious problem in Dominica and across the region, across the entire world, right? And so we're seeing an exodus of people leaving. And for some persons, entrepreneurship seems to be a, um, a solution to youth un unemployment. I do not necessarily feel like we're tapping into the potential of entrepreneurs in Dominica and the ecosystem in which our entrepreneurs are currently um, conducting business doesn't support them thriving. I mean, when we talk about revenues, all of these are avenues for revenue generation in Dominica. And so I think to be quite fair, while the recommendations will contribute somewhat, um, I'm not convinced that we will see a great reduction in debt um, from the revenues that have been proposed. What I do think is necessary is a rehaul of many of the different strata of sectors in Dominica, entrepreneurship, um, health, agriculture specifically, specifically because of that um, ambitious $700 million agenda for 2030. You know, because these things are realistic, However, it, uh, the practicality of the policies that have been proposed to support that particular goal, in my own opinion, um, I don't think they're necessarily going to achieve that. Um, so I do hope that we can, because we're talking about future, youth being the future, these debts are debts that are going to have to be addressed by youth in the future, right? We're the ones that, who have to come up with these policies to, uh, to tackle the debt 
that we are currently faced with. And obviously, it's going to probably even grow further in the future. So um, I feel, like I said, fiscal consolidation programs, fiscal solvency, and um, importantly, innovation with regards to looking at other revenue generation streams in Dominica. Uh, Stephanie, I saw you nodding and probably begging to respond. And I see Emana, yes. Okay, so we're going to take Stephanie and then we're going to move over to Emana. Um, so the main, the main suggestion, proposal that the government would have put forward in terms of debt restructuring was the imposition of the levy. Um, upon a, a U.S. $5,000 levy on every investor um, in the CBI program. And this would go towards the debt repayment fund. And obviously, that would help in terms of our, our debt situation. Um, I think it's important to add, though, that the ECCU target for public debt to GDP ratio is 60%. Um, Pre-COVID, we were not that far off from that. So I believe we were about 60 to 70% in 2018, 2019, respectively. It would have only been in the last two years, and um, the last two years being 2020, 2021, that we would have seen 20, 2021, 2022, that we would have seen this significant um, spike in our debt situation. And obviously that was because of the government's efforts to curb um, COVID-19. So we would have all seen the increased expenditure in terms of sourcing vaccines, in terms of setting up the different facilities and, and all of that. As we transition post-pandemic, and obviously those um, expenditure would not be as high. Um, in particular, I am interested to see how um, what will be the impact on the public debt to, to GDP ratio and to see how it would reflect that or essentially it should reflect that because that was one of the key areas that the government listed for such um, a substantial spike in that ratio. Um, in terms of other efforts, I agree, I agree with Ashma in terms of not much um, was done to really to really address the situation, and, and it is a critical situation um, in terms of public debt to GDP ratio. But the interesting thing, though, is that despite of having such a large ratio, other economies in the Caribbean have a significantly large, they have a, a, a debt situation as well. Again, it is something that it is not unique to us, um, given our, our economic structure, um, to have such a high high um high debt situation. But what the government needs to do despite these circumstances, despite these issues, is to still ensure that there is, you know, sufficient activity taking place into the economy that will really allow as Ashman said, like it shouldn't be a case where people feel hopeless. It shouldn't be a case where people feel so disenfranchised. It shouldn't be a a, a case where people don't feel, they, they, they're wondering how they have to make ends meet and, and those type of things. Yes, we have these circumstances that we have to deal with, given our structure, given our lack of resources, um, given um, our susceptibility to all these external shocks. But we are not the only country in the world dealing with these things. And so I think to, again, come back to looking at the data, doing research, looking at how different islands, other small islands, um, how other small states are tackling the issue and if we can develop a model and, and basically implement it so that we see some sort of reprise. So that to me is how we need to tackle the situation at hand. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. Um, in the interest of time, we are going to move on to the next item we have to present, which, which comes from you, actually, the panelists, your solutions. So we're going to cap it at about three minutes. We'll begin with you, Imana. So just about three minutes. Any solutions besides those you already previously mentioned to what the budget had presented? 
Solutions, of course, can be things added or things changed. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. I will say that one of my solutions that I think that we should at least focus on is trade diversification. Um, everyone spoke about that in their own different way. Um, Stephanie would have spoken about the entertainment and cultural sector. I think that this is an area we that is very underutilized and that is very overlooked. I mean, when we look at the, the amount of money that the World Creole Music Festival and the and our carnival and even other such festivals that we can bring about, um, we can build on brings into our economy. I mean, it's very substantive and is something that we should pay pay more attention to. Another another area that I think that we should look at again is our revenue. Um, it wasn't spoken about widely, but you know, our CBI program, our CBI program is one of the largest contributors to our GDP. You know, and with the new policies or the new restrictions that have, have been placed on us, um, is this something that we should expect? We should expect an impact. We should expect, even if it doesn't happen, but we can make it, we should have assumptions that it will negatively impact our economy. And therefore, again, it goes back to trade diversification. We should look at other ways for foreign direct investment into our economy, positive foreign direct investments into our economy. And that would go that goes back into um closing our debt to the GDP ratio, which um Stephanie spoke about. Presently, we um as of 2020, it was at 106%. And that is way above the threshold that of the, or the cap of 60% that was set by um Caribbean governments. So trade diversification again, and in trade diversification, I would look at even trade in services. And I only have three minutes to actually speak about it. And I would have, in the question that was passed, I would have probably referenced that. But, you know, um, <clears throat> trading services is one of our better performing, our better performing exports in the country. And it's one of our um, re great revenues, um, revenue, I think revenue gains. I think, yeah, we gain a lot of revenue from trading services. And I think that we need to, to pay more attention to it. And we need to, when we're looking at the digital economy, we should not leave out trading services and how we can incorporate the two in order to get the most of it. You know, and um, Tony would have um, spoken about it a lot in terms of the different um, solutions that he would have given into the digital economy and how to make the most of it. Again, the digital economy does not just fall into the entrepreneurial sector. Yes, we know that e-commerce is a big thing. Um, but it's also incorporating the use of artificial intelligence. So that goes to my solution into utilizing the digital hubs that they have across the island for training, not only just training on Microsoft Word and PowerPoint and um, graphic design or and these things like that, but how to utilize the digital economy and digitization as an income earner in every sector possible. Because digital um, technology falls under every single sector, even good governance, as I um, would have um, indicated in my opening remarks. So tell me how much time I have left. I don't want to rush. So, okay. so <laughs> um, that's huh? your time. <laughs> that's my time. We see my time done. Yeah. <laughs> right Thank you. Time, but yes. It looks like but it looks like the NYC time. would have to organize a part two, or at least next year we know this can't be done in one sitting. No, definitely not. Um, but these are we can look out for the next sitting of the National Youth Parliament. All right, so we move on to our in-house panelist, Mr. Lander. Thank you, Mr. For CP. Um, I'm excited about this and excited about this opportunity. And it's really eye-opening to see that even tonight I saw so much that could have been outlined within this budget. But I just want to outline a few themes that could um, assist um, in improving the national budget, some of which we already are doing, some of which we are already doing. So we want to applaud ourselves for that. Others we can improve on it, right? So first of all, sustainable development, allocating funds to projects 
that promote long-term economic, social, and environment sustainability. Climate resilience, we have spoken a lot about becoming the first climate resilient nation, um, priori prioritizing initiatives that address climate change impacts such as infrastructure improvements and disaster preparedness. Digital transformation, investment in technology and digital infrastructure to enhance go government services, education and economic diversification. Tourism diversification, develop niche tourism sectors to reduce reliance on a single industry and boost economic resilience. Tourism is where it is at globally and we should seek to investing in there. Green energy transition, allocate resources to renewable energy projects to reduce the de dependence on imported fossil fuels and lower carbon emissions. We're seeing a lot of headways being made with the geothermal project, so we can look forward to some form of um, <laughs> behave Wendy. Um, education and workforce development, enhance education and skills training programs to foster innovation and support a competitive workforce. Healthcare access, invest in healthcare infrastructure and services to ensure access to quality medical care for all citizens. Cultural preservation, this is something that I recognize also was significantly lacking within the budget this year. Um, allocating funds to safeguard and promote the unique cultural heritage of the island nation. And finally, infrastructure upgrades, investing in modernizing our transportation, telecommunications, and water supply systems to improve connectivity and quality of life. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Lander. We move on to Ms. McDougall. Okay, thank you so much. I don't have a lot to say. I, I just want to go back to, I think, what I propose as it relates to the theme metamorphose. Um, we speak about reset, transforming, and I feel, yeah, judiciously using limited resources straight from the economics textbook. Um, I feel it's necessary to ensure that, you know, these goals that we've set, we actually, you know, live to executing it because right now a lot of youth are hopeless. A lot of youth don't necessarily trust the, the politicians and trust the propositions that are being, you know, spewed in parliament. Sometimes, often more, um, we see that these policies are not necessarily translating directly to the realities of young people. And so while they may seem good on paper, right, um, the lack of inclusion of young people in, you know, creating these policies that are directly influence them is poor because how are you going to create a program for a blind person if you don't include them to understand, you know, from their lens, pun intended, from their lens, right? Um, you know, just how that solution can be addressed. And so I feel like with good intent, I mean, these policies, they can definitely contribute to this metamorphose that we need, however, its execution, its inclusion, and um, some of the themes that I think we definitely have to look at are sustainable economic activity. We need to see more activity happen. And um, that in itself can fuel and foster growth. But growth is one thing and development is another. And we are seeing transformations. We have been talking about transforming economies, but I mean, we're still in an agrarian society. The society is, 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 is mainly plantation society. We are not transforming and adding value to any products. We're still producing the same dashing, the same carrots. I mean, we're even importing them as well. We put a plastic ban. <laughs> All supermarkets are selling the, the products and giving you plastics at 25 cents. I mean, really and truly, there has to be some kind of monitoring. There has to be some kind of evaluation happens after these policies are put in place. I feel that's lacking. You understand? So... Um, Good intent, good approach um, with some of the policies that are in here, but it all comes down to, as um, Anthony mentioned earlier, the execution, and importantly, the data, which is lacking. Um, I feel that we have a lot of individuals who can potentially contribute to data in Dominica. I mean, we're investing heavily in human capital. Some people are returning, thank God. Um, and so I think we need to tap into that resource so that potentially we can create policies that are more informed, 
that are data driven, obviously, and that will have greater impact for youth and as well for entire society. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McDougall. We move on to our final in-house panelist, Mr. Edwards. Yeah, so I'll, I'll start very similar to how I began, um, just focusing on the digital economy, because I think you know, that's where my expertise is. Um, I think, yeah, you know, if we're talking about building the digital economy and we're serious about that, um, you know, it's a, a simple way to think of it is in two parts. There is the digital businesses and what they require is an enabling environment and there are the digital consumers and they have to be able to participate in that digital economy. Um, if when we talk about creating the enabling supporting environment, I'm gonna go back to um, previous suggestions and go a little deeper on them. So digital skills training, right? One of the key inputs to any business with digital in its name is gonna be the technologists, the people who are building the software. They're building software in the IT team at Jolly's. They're building software under their startup. They're doing <coughs> um, creative work since they, you know, they are, they are, they are graphic designer. These people need skills, right? They need those technical skills. Um, the government's one area the government can come in on is um, introducing those skills at multiple levels, right? Like the government is very closely involved with our educational system. A lot of the education we we experience from childhood to colleges, you know, it's subsidized at least by the government, right? Like so. I would expect to see digital skills being part of the national curriculum. I'd expect to see software engineering alongside chemistry at high school, right? And these are the sort of things that would mean that when people come out at 18, they're coming out at a high level and they can be pulled into digital businesses. Um, going on, on on the supportive environment, provision of digital infrastructure, that's the second key input digital businesses are gonna need, right? And And, that may just be conversations, that may be policies, that may be, um, you know, interventions on the government, from, from the government side with, um, with local banks, three digital payment processing, with um, local um, logistics companies, uh, because when something is sold online, um, it needs to be shipped somewhere, right? Like, um, uh, the government is already engaging very closely with the telecoms. Um, that's great, and that would need to, to, to be that would need to be developed in a very, you know, driven way. Like we want to ensure that every single person in this country can consume a digital, um, a digital product that's made, right? So, so the provision of that di that digital that, in that digital infrastructure. Earlier I mentioned targeting digital contracts to local firms. That's a way to both get the output of the contract and stimulate the economy and grants to finance local businesses. So that would go under the supportive environment and enabling local consumption is really, you know, I'm, that's much higher level. Again, telecoms coverage, telecoms affordability um, and generally making sure people have money to spend. It's not about digital businesses at that point. It's, you know, it's about businesses. So those are, my, um, those are my suggestions. Thank you. And we move on to our final panelist for our solutions, Ms. Pascal. I don't know if as, you know, economists, we kind of have that same background, um, that same trend of thought, but really and truly implementation is a very big one. If you look at the budget, on its own as is. It is a decent budget, but will these things actually be implemented? Will this plan actually come to fruition? And that is an entirely, that is a different and separate conversation in and of itself. Um, another solution that um, I think is pertinent, especially here as youth, is the inclusion of young people um, in the different sectors of the country, um, the prime minister would have made this concerted effort with, you know, ensuring that there's a university graduating every household. And, you know, we have so much young people who are skilled, who are knowledgeable, and above all, who are, you know, passionate about what they do. They are passionate about their field. And 
in as much as how hopeless or disfranchised we might be, at the end of the day, there's no place like home. At the end of the day, persons would like to come home. Um, and so I feel like in terms of being appreciated and being included in the development of, of this various policy, I think that's so important. Um, we would have seen Miss Katari um, Pemberton, she would have made the, the inclusion with the, the Bayfront and the, all the different aesthetics for um, for Rosu. I think if there was a way to get her and other young um, persons who are involved in architecture involved in different plans and to, to hear their opinion, hear their, their expertise on these things, because the country is investing so much money in improving the skills of our young people and then me improving the skills and we're not reaping the benefits and we're being the country, the, the, the Commonwealth of Dominica is not reaping these benefits. Even myself as an aspiring economist, um, I would like to be involved in, you know, these types of economic conversations and in terms of structuring, well, not structuring the budget, but in terms of, you know, being involved in these type of discussions in terms of improving financial literacy. Um, we see, so many persons, young men who are passionate about sports, um, hear their insight, hear their contribution and, and include that because what we as young people have, we have that perspective that our policymakers do not have. We take not just the information from what we see and what we know, but even in terms of what we have learned. And I genuinely believe that Dominica needs a think tank I talk about this so much with my different peers. I think we need a think tank. And if it's a way where the government can structure it, where it would be scaled to the creation of all the different internships and all these new professional spaces. So that way we can kind of tackle um, unemployment and more, import more importantly, under um, underemployment. That's a very major issue that we have in Dominica. A lot of persons who are qualified beyond measure and are in different fields where they're not using their degree, they're not using their qualification. Those are serious things that the government needs to consider when formulating such important documentation like our annual budget. So those are the, sol the solutions that I think the government should take into consideration. Panelists for such wonderful solutions proposed. Um, I know that we have one question in house. I'm not sure if anyone else has a question too, or comments. Just, just remember that we're keeping it brief. We're not here all evening, so I'm going to the lady first because I know her hand was up first. Okay, so we move on. Just a comment. If this were Parliament, I would never fall asleep. And I would not have been disappointed in you all. I'm very, you know, I'm, I came very early, about 20 minutes early, and she probably an hour early. And I really expected a high level of contributions, and you all went over my expectation. We need voices, voices like this in Parliament. You know, myself, I served about 11 years in Parliament. And what I'm hearing from you all, it gives me hope that Dominica has a future. I hope some of you are considering entering the parliament. But thank you very much. And I hope this presentation today is, is packaged properly and to reach more youth, because I really expected more youth here tonight. That's what my only disappointment. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Um, this is not Parliament, so that's good. So we don't we don't have to get into the mental case tonight. But I'm, I, let me just say I'm, I'm very proud of the National Youth Council for putting this on. I am proud to still be considered a youth. <laughs> don't know for how much longer, but I'm, I'm very proud of this. And this shows what we talk about all the time what we like to talk about. There's so many things that you guys said. I took some notes. I wish I could comment on everything. This might take a week. It should be a series next time, not just one night. It should be a, like a, a one week, like how we have parliament for one week. You should probably do this for a week. But let me just say, Ash, one of the things that you said about, about monitoring and evaluation is very, very important. 
execution is where you're going to see if all these words that we've been hearing mean anything. So, so what I think the National Youth Council can do as a humble recommendation is probably get involved in some of the recommendations. You, you, we spoke about the green economy. We spoke about digital economy. We spoke about all these things. Maybe we can try to do a bit of monitoring on our own. Another thing that's important, and I recognize it even in, in the deliberations, a lot of people, there's a, it seems to be almost like a sleight of hand where we focus very much on the presentation of the budget and not the actual estimates. In Parliament, we are approving the estimates, not the words. So go deeper. Go into the figures. Look at the different ministries. Look at where they're allocating the money. And, and it will answer a lot of questions. But also go a little deeper and look at the budget before. Do the analysis between them. Hey, what happened last year? What did we, uh, and, I, and I heard you alluding to it. What did we say we were going to do last year? And what are we doing in the same area this year? How are we moving such an important ministry, like the Ministry of Youth? Why are we bouncing it around all over the place? We're not sure how much money we're spending here. Do that. And, and g ask for help. Get more involved in doing the analysis yourself. Because here's, here's one of the things. And you said it. A lot of people think that the youth is the future, but we are now. Those debts, we have to pay them. All of those things that we are doing now and we all fancy about it, us and our children are the ones who are going to pay for it. And, and do not be relegated to, well, what's in it for young people? No, 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 no. Everything is for us because we affect everything and everything that is done is going to affect young people. So we have a voice, you have a voice. I'm proud of what you guys are doing. Keep up the conversation. And, and let's take possession of our country. It's ours and it's our responsibility. Congratulations, guys. Hi, good evening. I'm from the UK. Um, I spent 34 years in youth work. And one of the reasons I'm here tonight is to understand what young people are about and what it is that they're doing and what they want to do and where young people are going. Because I'll come back here to live very soon to work with young people. That's my plan. But one of the things I just want to... There are so many notes I made this evening. Congratulations for what you did. But one of the things, amongst all the things I talked about... You see this thing about digital economy? Start again? I'm going to start again, right? Okay, just checking. I, didn't I don't remember what I just said. <laughs> right? Right. So one of the things that is very important is that when we talk about debt and things of that nature, there are moves being made internationally that will impact what it is that we're doing. One of those things is cryptocurrency and understanding how cryptocurrencies will affect how people do things. And is Dominica preparing itself to be a part of that whole process? Because financially, things are changing. One of the big things that changed things financially, and I was speaking to my brother here today, we had a long conversation at his house today. We were just, just having a general chat. Is that money, as we know it, is going to change. Things always change. And it started when COVID hit, because I'm in the UK when COVID hit, you couldn't, you, one of the things we, we, we couldn't, you know, you had to be wiping everywhere, you couldn't touch certain things. So therefore we stopped using paper money for a while. But that was just a test case. Because right now they're talking about going paperless. But to go paperless, online banking and so on is gonna be very, very important because there comes a time when you walk up to, to the frog bank here, the frog, well, I, I say the frog bank or the logo, but it's the natural bank. <laughs> Right, you go to the bank, and every time you go there, there's a queue of about 40 people before you. On average, five minutes each person. You know how long you're standing in the queue for waiting, right? So that digital thing that we're talking about is making sure that all of our people are able to pick up their phone and be able to do online banking, etc., etc., etc. Worldwide, only four percent of the world 
has what we call a cryptocurrency wallet. That's a tiny, tiny fraction of the entire world population. But money is changing. And in order to keep pace with what's going on, we're not immune, immune for anything, we've got to keep pace with what's going on internationally, where are things are going. Cryptocurrency is one of those areas, right? Um, I, I do a bit of it, and, you know. But the other thing about it is that it is being said, I am not been proved yet, but it is being said that by going down that route, that could help a lot of countries who are in debt get themselves out of debt. Not the World Bank, IMF, will the World Bank, only America has a veto on the world. Hello. Okay. Um, it was important for me to come here tonight because even though I may not be in any of the, you know, youth groups or so, I am very, I am very passionate about Dominica and its development, um, as many people may know on Facebook. And some comments, really, in terms of mental health. Yes, we need all those things, but I feel like our main problem is our culture and our, our thinking about mental health because even those before us, you know, maybe when we were children and we would, you know, maybe suggest that we were depressed or say that we were sad and our parents would tell us, well, what are we depressed about? Or we can't be depressed. Or we would, you know. Right. What are we doing? Come down. Right, so for the unemployment, what are we doing to make sure that people can get jobs? Are we manufacturing anything? Are we, do we have any sort of trainings at school? Any vocational skills, you know? Because a lot of, there are a lot of young men unemployed because they are not academically inclined and there are no, there is no school or trainings in place to say, for them to go and learn carpentry, elect, um, plumbing, and those kinds of things. So what are we really putting in place to make sure that people can get jobs in terms of sustainability even? Right now we are importing human capital, importing people to come and work because we do not have people who can do the jobs, right? So I feel like these are the kind of things that we're not really talking about to that extent, even with the budget, I didn't really hear much discussion about how are we going to generate revenue in the country. And sports, we are not taking sports seriously in any regard, right? We don't even have a, a feel for those that run in track. And athletes, especially those that run in track, they are really putting Dominica's name to the world, and we are not really supporting them in any way. So... Yeah, these are just some of the things I think we should talk about, and customs as well. Nobody's talking about customs, and it is our biggest problem, <laughs> to be serious. Like, I, I don't know what category it's falling in or whatever it is, but we need to speak about that. And thank you for what you're doing, and I really wish you had more young people here tonight, but thank you. And we have a final comment.
right? I smiled and I was like, this is my economics lecturer <laughs> because she taught me. And my question was certainly um, monitoring and you mentioned it as well. And my line of thinking really was, how do we achieve monitoring or what is achieving monitoring at the highest level? And I was asking Jamasha whether or not there was a report done in the budget presented, the fiscal the national budget presented. And my thinking is what do we, what, what is our response or how do we feel about doing a report on the fiscal budget that is presented yearly? And that is holding the government accountable, right? That's the correct word, accountable at the highest degree. And that is monitoring at the highest degree, starting at the helm of the decision making. So that's my view. And I want you to know. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Alfred. Um, I will disregard the one minute notice that I've been given. But I do agree with regards to reporting. And this is actually one of the pillars that has been proposed with regards to um, how this reset is going to be achieved. More effective governance with stronger oversight, becoming more accountable to and in touch with the needs of our citizens. And I do believe that the reporting is necessary because, I mean, we're seeing, I, and I, I want to go back to a point that Mr. Delbert made um, with regards to delving into the estimates because I did do that, but time wouldn't have allowed it. And this is why I bring it up because um, when we talk about, for example, things that were published in previous budgets, the Goodwill Secondary School is something that was put into the budget Allocations were made in 2021, in 2022, and the same in 2023. And importantly, I will speak about the Dominica State College because I'm there every day. And within the same budget in 2021, in 2022, and again in 2023, budget allocations were made with regards to the infrastructural development of DSC. Um, we've established renovating one block. I mean, two blocks remain untouched. The library remains untouched. Academic ad administrative buildings remain untouched. And these were all addressed in previous budgets. Allocate monies were allocated. And while I understand that things come up, you know, and monies have to be redistributed. The point is we are prioritizing. We are saying that education is a priority. And so if it is, it means then that, you know, if we're allocating monies to certain things in previous budgets, we need to ensure that we hold, you know, the policymakers accountable for these particular um, budgets, um, budgetary allocations that they make. Importantly, one thing I saw, for example, in this budget is a significant increase in the expenditures, or I should say in the allocations to the office of the Prime Minister, the capital expenditure, I mean over, it was 97 million in 2022, and then in 2023 it's 265, and I feel too, and I wonder, yes I read that, I read that, <laughs> and I, I had to wonder, well, like what is the justification for this capital, increased capital expenditure when there's a decrease in housing, there's a decrease in public works from 2022, um, decreasing other capital expenditures that are allocated, you know? Um, and these are, this is where the monitoring comes in because, you know, while it's mentioned, you know, while it's stated here in a table that these are the capital expenditures, we don't even know how these monies are being expended, right? And so it's definitely necessary. Perhaps reporting can come in, but I feel as well it's really the onus is on citizens. We have to hold our parliamentarians or politicians accountable because if we don't um, obviously they will have no they would, ne they would not necessarily see the need to ensure that they're you know reporting in a timely fashion and reporting in a transparent manner as well thanks and uh, i think this is a very great point for us to sort of sum up and i want to take this opportunity um, as President and our Chief Counsel to recognize that this falls well within our pillars of who we are and what we are seeking to achieve within this tenure of 2023 to 2025, falling well within the first pillar of our youth, recognizing that our youth have a voice and that the voice needs to be heard. And uh, this, I heard many mentions about 
the young people should be in parliament and should be um, should have had an opportunity to be in parliament. And this is exactly what we, the framework in which we would like to be presenting to the um, necessary powers that be that will be supporting the the reestablishment and and formalization, I should say, of the National Youth Parliament, because what we envision it to be is a sitting parliament that will, for example, when the national budget is brought forward to the public, we will be given an opportunity to debate it in the House. So this is what, this is, this is a, a snapshot of the vision that we have within the National Youth Council of Dominica, and as you can well, well imagine, the voices that you have heard are from a pattern parcel of the National Youth Council, both current and those who are, would have served on the council before. Tony has supported us. Emana has continued to support us through our, our environmental club, um, our committee. Um, Stephanie, whenever we call, she's always willing to support us. So these are the young people and very correct, we are not the future, we are the now. And uh, this, I'm, I'm getting goosebumps because I'm hearing a lot of good things coming out and good comments. But my point, and the young lady who's sitting here made a very good point. I wish I saw m more young people in this room. But I saw them online and we, may, and we can argue the digital modernization and everything. We young people don't need to come in person. I, yeah, 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 yeah. We're meeting you where you are, but you need to meet us where you are, where we are. And you need to meet the policymakers where they are. So that means that we have to come forward and put our voices together, listen to what matters to you as young people, and share your views, and do so in a positive and pragmatic and civil way as we've done this evening. Congratulations to all the panelists. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, there is someone who will give a conclusion and, th and vote of thanks. But I just thought it would be remiss of me not to, to submit by saying that I'm very happy that this has happened and I'm looking forward to future discussions of this nature. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Landa. For a minute I said you were coming for my job. <laughs> but we'd like to thank all panelists this evening, Imana, Stephanie, and um, the three inside, I forgot their name for a minute. <laughs> Fire, Ashma, and Tony. Thank you all for supporting us on this endeavor. I must say it was something that was a brainchild of one of the executive members. It started off as something we wanted to do, just a little virtual Zoom and stream, but then we saw the importance of having the panelists in person and really trying our best to engage the wider public through the live streaming. And we can see the fruit of that tonight. So let's give us a round of applause again. And to formally say thank you, we invite one of our exec members. So yes, good night once again. I don't want to keep us too long again. So I just want to say thanks to the panelists for agreeing, for UE for always being a partner to the NYC and allowing us to use utilize the space for the media, DBS Radio, GIS, and any other media houses that are broadcasting this live so it can reach the wider people. I am disappointed in the in-house um, viewing, but this is online and it will remain online and people can go back and view. So this is one of our pros of the digital economy. <laughs> um, we had a caterer. I want to thank her for catering snacks for the in-house. You guys missed out. <laughs> and also to Island Stage Entertainment for the PA system. So thank you very much, everyone, for making this possible. Good night. So this marks the end of our panel discussion. Please stay tuned for all the updates from the National Youth Council. Very soon, National Youth Parliament will be staged again. So stay tuned. Look out for that. Any young people who are interested in serving on the National Youth Parliament, very soon a call will go out for applications. So please look out for that. <laughs>